Tonight we're going to be going over some of the most famous true crime stories of all time. Mary Rogers. On the night of July 25th, 1841, Mary Rogers, who lived in New York City, told her mother and fiancé she was spending the evening visiting relatives in New Jersey. The 21-year-old left and never returned home. Three days later, her badly beaten body turned up floating in the Hudson River near Hoboken, New Jersey. No one could imagine who might have a motive to harm Mary other than her fiancé. However, he had an airtight alibi. Mary attracted a slew of admirers who knew her as the beautiful cigar girl from her work in a downtown cigar emporium. No one seemed to suspect a stalker might be involved in her disappearance. The only witness claiming to have seen Mary that night told a story involving an illegal abortion ring that didn't seem to fit and couldn't be corroborated. Within a year, the case had gone cold and Mary's fiancé committed suicide by overdosing on a type of opium on the very shores her body had washed up on. The whole tragic tale might have faded from history except that author Edgar Allan Poe, who would become obsessed with the case, memorialized it in The Mystery of Mary Roget. Similar to its real-life counterpart, the tale ends with the trail going hopelessly cold. Jack the Ripper Between August and November 1888, five prostitutes turned up dead on the streets of London's Whitechapel neighborhood. All were found within a mile of another, two on the same night, and all had their throats slashed from left to right. The lead investigators in the case suspected the killer was left-handed, as all but one had been gutted with precision. Leading investigators to suspect the killer might have trained as a butcher or a surgeon. The killer managed to commit these murders and escape undetected, which suggested the killer was familiar with the rhythms of the neighborhood. The murderer, who the press referred to as Jack the Ripper, was never identified. Perhaps Jack the Ripper died before he was able to carry out any additional murders. Or perhaps his killing evolved over time, as other murders occurred in Whitechapel over the next three years, which bore some similarities to Jack's work. In either case, Jack the Ripper is now long gone, and it appears he has taken his identity with him to the grave. Of course, that doesn't stop us from speculating as to who he might have been. Bell Gunnis Wherever turn of the 20th century Norwegian immigrant Bell Gunnis went, people had a habit of turning up dead, especially well-insured people, including several of her husbands, boyfriends, and even children. Still, it took a quarter century and at least 40 kills for anyone to even suspect Bell might be the common denominator. But before a solid case against Bell could be put together, Bell's farmhouse burnt to the ground on April 28, 1908, and Bell's remains were thought to be found inside by investigators. With no other viable suspects, all the murder cases with respect to which Bell was under investigation went cold. But that's not the only case that went cold that day. It turns out that the fire was arson, and Bell's hired hand, Ray Lamphere was convicted of setting the fire. He was acquitted with regard to Bell's resulting death when he convinced the jury Bell wasn't dead, but rather she had hired him to start the fire to help her fake her death. As such, Bell's death remains unsolved. The Black Dahlia Aspiring actress Elizabeth Short was just 22 years old when she was found murdered in a vacant lot in Los Angeles on January 15, 1947. The Black Dahlia case led to a lengthy investigation that included a roster of more than 150 suspects. What was lacking, however, was any hard evidence or even remotely reliable witness. Today, the Black Dahlia murder remains one of the oldest cold case files in Los Angeles, as well as the city's most famous, the Somerton Man. One morning in December 1948, 
A well-dressed, well-muscled middle-aged man was found dead on Somerton Beach in Adelaide, Australia. The Somerton man, as he became known, carried no identification, and all the labels on his clothing had been systematically removed. The only clue was a piece of paper found in one of his pockets with the words Tom and Shud printed on it, which is Persian for it has ended. The paper was traced to a book of Persian poetry found in a nearby parked car from which the last page had been torn. Scribbled in the book was the phone number of a local woman who, when questioned, claimed she didn't know the man. Also scribbled in the book were a few lines of cryptic text no one has ever been able to decipher. No one ever came forward to identify the man whom the coroner concluded had been poisoned. The Fugitive Case On July 4th, 1954, 31-year-old Marilyn Shepard was beaten to death in the Cleveland home she had shared with her husband, Sam, while their 7-year-old son lay sleeping in his bedroom down the hall. Sam claimed the killer was a bushy-haired intruder who had also assaulted him, leaving him with serious injuries. However, the evidence didn't support this, and jurors believed the prosecution's theory that Sam killed Marilyn to get out of the marriage. Sam, who was distrusted and reviled by the general public, spent 10 years in prison before the U.S. Supreme Court found excessive publicity had deprived him of a fair trial. On retrial, Sam was acquitted and spent the rest of his life trying to find Marilyn's killer. Sam's determination inspired the television show The Fugitive, as well as the film of the same name. The Love Me Tender Murders on the night of December 28, 1956, teenage sisters Patricia and Barbara Grimes went to a local Chicago movie theater to see the film Love Me Tender. When they never returned home, a frantic search ensued. Although the police received a number of tips, none panned out. The girls' bodies were discovered by the side of a nearby road. Unfortunately, their bodies yielded so few clues Investigators weren't even able to settle a time or cause of death. Nevertheless, several suspects emerged, the most promising of whom was a teenage boy who actually confessed to killing the girls. However, since his confession was elicited legally through a lie detector test that the law said the boy wasn't old enough to be subjected to, the boy couldn't be tried for the crime. Whether or not the boy was the killer, the case remains unsolved to this day. The Walker Family On December 19, 1959, the four members of the Walker family were brutally murdered in their Osprey, Florida home. Their bodies were discovered the next day. The crime scene revealed few clues beyond a bloody boot, a partial fingerprint on a tub faucet, and a cell phone cigarette wrapper. However, police managed to call 587 witnesses and or suspects, but none panned out. Not even Perry Smith or Dick Hickok. The two men were apprehended in Las Vegas a week later on suspicion of murdering another family under strikingly similar circumstances. The Clutter family of Kansas, whose massacre became the subject of Truman Capote's true crime classic in cold blood. While Smith and Hickok were eventually convicted of the Clutter family killings, authorities were unable to piece together a case against them with regard to the Walker case, which remains unsolved. If Sam and Hickok were involved, they have both since taken that secret with them to the grave. On January 26th, 1966, Nancy Beaumont allowed her three young children, ages 9, 7, and 4, to travel unsupervised by local bus to a nearby Somerton Beach in Adelaide, Australia. Since such unsupervised travel was the norm of the day, Nancy had no reason to think her children were in any danger. She was wrong. 
The children didn't return home that afternoon, and a frantic search ensued. Investigators learned that the children had been interacting pleasantly, and seemingly with some level of familiarity, with a tall, blonde man in his mid-thirties, both at the beach and at a nearby food shop, where the man apparently gave the children money to buy meat pies. There was some hope that the mystery might be solved in 2013, after two brothers told police they had spent that January weekend in 1966 digging a hole at a factory at the request of the factory owner, Harry Phipps. But the site was excavated and no bodies were found, so the mystery continues. The Hijacking of Northwest Flight 305 to Seattle On November 24, 1971, as Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 took off from Portland, Oregon, its passengers had no idea the middle-aged man in a dark suit who sat near the rear of the plane, smoking a cigarette and speaking quietly to the young stewardess taking his drink order, that he wasn't just ordering a bourbon and soda. He was advising the stewardess that he had a bomb he fully intended to use if his demands were not met. Those demands included $200,000 in cash, which would be around a million dollars today, four parachutes, a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel a plane on arrival, and a second leg trip to Mexico. After the demands of the man, who was traveling under the alias Dan Cooper, and has been known ever since as D.B. Cooper, were met, Cooper disappeared from the plane en route to Mexico. Presumably, he left via parachute, although no one can say since the flight crew had left Cooper alone in the rear of the plane. In any event, his parachute was never found, and the ransom money, in marked bills, was never used. Although some of that money turned up in 1980, along the banks of the Oregon branch of the Columbia River, the FBI worked the case for 45 years, but the man known as Davy Cooper has never been found. Despite that, the FBI surmises Cooper likely didn't survive the parachute jump, and that all the favorite suspects, including Richard Floyd McCoy and Robert Rackstraw, are now dead. Amateur sleuths continue to probe to this day. The Zodiac Killer the man who called himself Zodiac apparently enjoyed taunting San Francisco area police as much as he enjoyed killing, which he apparently enjoyed very much. The first time Zodiac struck on December 20th, 1968, shooting and killing two teens parked on a lover's lane, police approached the investigation as a standard homicide case. Populating their suspect list with people whom the victims knew and working the if teens are involved, then drugs must be as well angle. The next time Zodiac shot a couple in a car, he called the police himself, just in case they weren't sharp enough to figure out that these two crimes were the work of the same man. A man intent on controlling the narrative. This was also when Zodiac began contacting newspapers, offering titillating details on the actual killer. Only the actual killer would have known, and threatening to up his level of violence if his letters weren't printed. Over the next two years, Zodiac claimed responsibility for 37 lives. Although law enforcement was only aware of five, and not after 1969, that being said, it was in November 1969 that Zodiac wrote a letter to the press proclaiming, I shall no longer announce to anyone when I commit my murders. They shall look like routine robberies, killings of anger, and a few fake accidents, etc. So perhaps Zodiac did continue killing, albeit with a revised modus operandi. In any case, the trail went cold, and although roughly 2,500 suspects were interviewed 
and a prime suspect identified, Arthur Lay Allen. Zodiac's identity remains an unsolved mystery. The Isdale Woman On November 29, 1970, the badly burned body of a woman was discovered in Norway's Isdalen Valley. Her burns rendered her unrecognizable, she bore no identification, and the labels in her clothing had been cut out. With 50 sleeping pills found in her stomach, the woman appeared to have died by suicide. But the plot grew thicker when her possessions were discovered at a nearby railway station, revealing eight fake passports, a wad of douche marks, and an unsolvable cryptic note. No one ever claimed the body, which was never connected with any missing persons case. Accordingly, the case went cold. However, a podcast on the topic, Death in Ice Valley, has inspired some listeners to do their own type of sleuthing. So stay tuned, because this cold case may be heating up. The Tylenol Murders On September 29, 1982, seven people around the Chicago area died after taking extra-strength Tylenol capsules tainted with cyanide. It quickly became apparent it wasn't that all Tylenol was tainted, but rather these particular bottles, which appeared to have been placed randomly in drugstores. Law enforcement helped avert further poisonings by driving around, confiscating pills and bottles, and shouting into bullhorns, don't take Tylenol. At great cost, Tylenol's manufacturer recalled all 31 million bottles throughout the nation replaced capsules with caplets, and introduced tamper-free pill bottle caps. Despite a nationwide dragnet, several smaller-scale copycat crimes in other states, and the arrest of a man who tried to use the tragedy to extort money from Tylenol, the perpetrator was never identified. Amber Hagerman on the afternoon of January 13, 1996, nine-year-old Amber Hagerman and her five-year-old brother Ricky were playing, as they often did, in an abandoned grocery store parking lot in Arlington, Texas. When Ricky went home, Amber stayed to play some more, but she never returned. Despite that a man, James Kevill, now in his late 70s, witnessed Amber's abduction with his own, from his own backyard and immediately called the police, offering a description of Amber's kidnapper, a white or Hispanic male, aged 25 to 40, under 6 feet tall, with a medium build. The trail quickly went cold. Four days later, Amber's body was discovered in a creek behind an apartment complex near the parking lot where she was last seen. Amber's autopsy revealed she had been kept alive for two days after her abduction. Unfortunately, it revealed little else, and the case went cold. The one bright light in this case is that it led to the establishment of the Amber Alert System, which alerts the public when a child has been kidnapped in the hopes that they can be tracked down before they meet the same fate that Amber Hagerman did. <laughs>